everyone. It's my pleasure to moderate this panel discussion on leveraging the COVID-19 crisis for a sustainable future. As several of our previous speakers have alluded to, the ASEAN region is facing a triple whammy in disruptive trends, that of the potential long-term economic scarring arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change and the disruptive technological changes in the form of AI and the Internet of Things. And it is in this context that our speakers this morning will share their perspectives on what can be done to put ASEAN region on a more sustain sustainable path. Our first speaker is Ms. Juki Hong. She is executive director and board member of the Kari ASEAN Research and Advocacy, an independent think tank dedicated to supporting the ASEAN economic integration through advocacy and research. Ms. Hong will share her views on the state of ASEAN's response thus far to mitigating the effects of climate change and some recommendations along on the way forward. Our second speaker is Dr. Venkachalam Andumoji. He is Director of Research Strategy and Innovation at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia in Indonesia. He has served as a member of the G20 Task Force in Green Financing, APEC Resource Panel at, on Circular Economy, and, and the ASEAN Expert Committee on Climate Resilience. He will speak on the concept of circular economy and discuss ways in which it can contribute to longer term resilience for the ASEAN economies. And our third speaker is Mr. Go Xiaohyong. He is Executive Director of Global Policy and Government Affairs in the Asia Pacific for Cisco Systems. He will share his views on the impact of disruptive trends in digitalization, cybersecurity and automation, um, um, that we'll have on the region's workforce and how to better prepare the workforce for the future. A warm welcome to all of our panelists and we're honored to have you to take the time with us to, to speak at this round table. Uh, before I hand over the floor to our first speaker, I would like to let the audience know that each speaker will be speaking for about 15 minutes, after which we will open the, the floor for questions and answers. So please feel free to type your questions uh, for the speakers in the Q&A chat box. Without further delay, uh, Ms. Hong, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Sue Ann. Um, colleagues at ICS, fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I'm really honored and humbled to be given this uh, opportunity uh, by ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute, uh, Sincerely Center, to speak at this session at the 36 ASEAN Roundtable and to explore how we can leverage the COVID-19 crisis for a sustainable future. Now, the topic given to me today is, is a green transformation after COVID-19 possible? Yes, not only that it is possible with strong political determination, it is also a goal to be pursued. Therefore, my presentation is structured as recovering, safer, better, and greener. Now, I'm going to approach my presentation by firstly, setting the big picture of where we are now, globally speaking, and really what problems we're trying to solve. And second, zooming into ASEAN, I'm going to touch briefly on what has ASEAN committed to in terms of the NDCs of the Paris Agreement. And thirdly, I will touch on green measures in ASEAN member states' national responses to COVID-19 pandemic and what measures we can and must take to close the gaps. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, now echoing the theme of uh, this uh, seminar that ASEAN is in a crisis mode, not ju just because of the pandemic, uh, also not just because of the political and security tensions as Director Choi has mentioned earlier today, but also because of the existential threat of climate change. Now in August this year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC released the sixth assessment report based on scientific evidence and has confirmed that human actions or activities have unequivocally linked to the warming of the earth, sea and land within the span of 2000 years. And every of the last four decades has been success, uh, successively warmer than any decade that preceded it since 
1815. Now you see the graph on the left hand side with a sharp spike in recent times towards the right. Uh, that shows that how intense the situ situation is. And uh, climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe. And I quote the report, it says that many changes in the climate system become larger in direct relation to increasing global warming. They include increases in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather, and many changes due to past and future greenhouse gas emissions are irreversible for centuries to millennia, especially changes in the ocean, ice sheets, and global sea level. Now, the section of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres warned that the IPCC report is code red for humanity. And unless the leadership of the major economies step in, the Paris Agreement's targets would go up in smoke. And I quote, now, let's go, go to the next slide. Now, after the next slide, please. Yes, after the IPC, uh, IPCC report, newly released reports and data have also shown the gaps that desperately need to be bridged. For instance, according to the Climate Action Tracker, newly updated uh, NDCs, uh, which is the nationally determined contribution submitted so far uh, last year and this year, have narrowed the gap closer to the 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming by only about 15%. If you look at the chart, it is actually between 11 to 14%. And, uh, but if the G20 economies that account for 75 of the global GHG um, emissions set ambitious targets to reach net zero emissions by 2050, there's a chance that global warming can be limited to 1.7 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, we're on a path to a 2.4 degree Celsius future, according to another report by the World Report Institute and Climate Analytics. Next slide. Now this slide before you shows you the various shared social economic pathway scenarios of global changes until the end of the century. We require very low greenhouse gas emissions to keep the warming of the global um, warming of our Earth to within 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, our inaction today is going to cost us greatly, but we can and still, uh, we can still act now in the form of climate mitigation and adaptation, especially uh, in terms of, say, energy transitioning, but we may still be able to turn back the tides. Now, according to a synthesis report on the NDCs released by UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it showed that a decisive 45% cut in GHG emissions by 2030 is needed to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And that's 45% cut in nine years to keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius target in sight. Next slide, let's zoom into ASEAN. Now, ASEAN collectively emitted about 5.6% uh, greenhouse gases of the world's total. Now, if you look at the total GHG emissions, um, Indonesia has the highest emissions among ASEAN member states uh, because of its size of economy. Uh, it ranked at seventh in the world. But if you look at uh, CO2 emission per capita, um, Indonesia's uh, per capita uh, carbon dioxide emission is actually ranked 108th in the world and sixth in ASEAN whereas uh, Brunei has the highest uh, CO2 emissions per capita and ranked the fifth in the world and highest in ASEAN, followed by Singapore and Malaysia. So although most ASEAN countries are relatively small GHG emitters compared to large economies, ASEAN's energy-related uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions are projected to more than double by 2040. Collectively, ASEAN's fossil fuel reliance and its economic growth trajectory will mean rising uh, green, greenhouse gas emissions in the future. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Now, as it is, um, ASEAN member states' um, GHG emission reduction targets in the NDCs are considered to be less than ambitious and have even been projected to miss the mark. Yeah, if you look at a quick look at the NDC submitted um, to date, I think three countries have set unconditional targets, Brunei, Malaysia, and Singapore, and other countries such as uh, Indonesia, Laos, uh, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam have set both conditional and unconditional targets. Cambodia, Cambodia has set conditional targets, 
And in terms of the, the range, it is ranging from 5% to 73%. Some, some projections released prior to the NDC updates have said, for instance, according to the ASEAN Center for Energy, under the member states' current policies, ASEAN's NDCs would likely not be achieved. And under a BAU scenario, business as usual scenario, previously developed by the AC in 2017, it estimated that ASEAN's uh, CO2 emissions per capita is projected to rise 140% between uh, 2015 to 2040. So that's work for, uh, there's work for us to do in ASEAN in general. Now, just to um, share with you some of the work that we've done earlier this year, uh, next slide, please. We have uh, released, uh, Chari has uh, released four reports examining the COVID-19 related measures that were rolled out in 2020. We reviewed open source data uh, on the following subjects, COVID-19 stimulus measures, uh, national budget and taxation, overseas investments, future of work, equality and social justice. Now, based on that, we found that ASEAN countries have prioritized saving lives and stabilizing the economy over the green agenda in 2020. Now, in terms of stimulus spending, green policy measures were not a priority in ASEAN. When it comes to taxation and national budget, uh, there were minimal green policies that were introduced in response to COVID-19, as they are more focused on stabilizing the economy. In terms of overseas investment, uh, FDI inflows into ASEAN declined 31% to, uh, in, in 2020 compared to a decline of 42% globally, but of course that was last year. Uh, green policies were also not a priority in ASEAN's investment-related policy responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, with uh, most of our ASEAN members focusing greater digitalization, which was also touched by other speakers, public health-related investment incentives, support for SMEs, uh, etc. And in terms of uh, future of work, equality and social justice, uh, most short-term stimulus packages in ASEAN have little focus on climate-aligned green jobs. Next slide. And from there, um, we have identified at least 21 actions that can be taken by ASEAN member states um, in terms of uh, making stimulus packages green, uh, green national budget and taxation, green investment and green jobs. Now, uh, what you see before you is a list of uh, 21 actions. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them uh, and they are by no means exhaustive. Some are easier to implement, some controversial, such as the carbon tax and uh, such as the review of fossil fuel subsidy. But the message is um, there is a window for ASEAN countries to build back its economies, not only safer, better, but also greener and towards a low carbon recovery with the right policy tools to advance climate mitigation and adaptation goals. Now, it is also imperative that ASEAN trade policies adopt a climate-aligned direction. Um, for instance, ASEAN needs a green deal, such as the one in the uh, European Union, that guides our nation going forward, perhaps after 2025, when our second uh, ASEAN second blueprint comes to an end. We also understand that given the current pandemic, survival of our businesses is the top priority of SMEs. Now, however, green compliance will eventually impact SMEs in the supply chains of larger businesses and financial institutions will continue to transition to be more climate aligned and therefore preparing the SMEs for to be green ready is critically, critically important to look into given the opportunity of economic reset once the pandemic has stabilized. Now, moving on, the good news is that um, in ASEAN, Next slide, please. Yeah, experts and policymakers in ASEAN generally showed a consensus that uh, a greener ASEAN is a goal that must be pursued alongside economic recovery and not at the expense of economic stability. Now, the pandemic allows ASEAN a window to achieve just that because governments inject fiscal spending to stimulate economic growth. Uh, just for example, the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework has a dedicated strategy five that is advanced towards a more sustainable and resilient ASEAN. Uh, 
And Brunei, uh, of course, we're coming to the end of the year. Brunei's um, priority economic deliverables, PEDs, have also got a pillar dedicated to the sustainability agenda. Um, in, indeed, uh, what is crucial here is the energy transition that should be prioritized as per the uh, Brunei's uh, PEDs um, in ASEAN's policy responses as it rebuilds itself from the pandemic. Now, there is also the uh, ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation, APAEC, Phase 2, uh, between 2021 to 2025. Um, however, if we look at it, ASEAN still prioritizes a fossil fuel economy by optimizing the role of clean coal technology and carbon capture utilization and storage CCUS towards a low carbon economy. Now, it has only aimed to achieve a 32% energy intensity reduction aspirational target by 2025, based on the 2005 levels. And with that, it brings me to um, my last slide, which is um, what do we do about this? Now, it is recognized that ASEAN's developmental gaps and political economy are sentiments that need sensitive co uh, consideration in transition to a low carbon economy, especially when it comes to measures that may immediately expose a country's economy to transition risks. Is green transformation possible? Yes, with rebuilding ASEAN towards a sustainable future in mind, as ASEAN works its way out of this pandemic, we can make this crisis an opportunity for actions to be taken and advocacy to be pushed for. Here, I would like to propose the five C's that ASEAN member states can take. Firstly, is Climate, uh, climate crisis, we need to recognize that climate change is an existential threat and drastic actions must be taken now, and the key word being now. And uh, secondly, the COVID-19 pandemic recovery must be a green recovery because it gives us an opportunity to build back greener. COVID-19 is actually regarded as a last chance window for us to decisively aim for a reset as governments inject stimulus packages into rebuilding economies. Um, although green elements were absent in various fiscal policy responses in 2020, ASEAN member states have various, uh, in various degrees um, have got a different formulated climate strategy and AMSs of ASEAN should continue to use uh, various fiscal policy tools and trade policies to move the green agenda. Thirdly, um, carbon reduction and reform, GHG emissions reduction must be pursued. And as I said earlier, it is a decisive 45% cut by 2030. According to IRENA, by 2050, the decarbonization of the energy system globally will generate a 15% increase in welfare. And we need to also overhaul our fossil fuel heavy economic model, aggressive reforms and integrate a long-term national and regional development strategy to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Fourthly, um, cash, the fourth C is cash or financial assistance. Now developed countries must deliver their financial promises and pledges of uh, 100 billion US dollars a year. And according to a recent report, the amount is short by 20 billion in the year 2020. So more pressure should be put in the developed countries to realize their pledges towards helping developing countries, especially at the upcoming COP26. And finally, it's about climate diplomacy. Now, green recovery is considered to be a touchy and a delicate subject for some ASEAN member states. Um, understandably, given the state of our development and needs are different. It is important to make sure that climate diplomacy balances both climate and economic equity for the developing countries while preserving common climate resilience for our future generations. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jun Hee. Uh, let's uh, move on now to uh, Dr. An Wu, who will uh, give his presentation on the circular economy. Dr. Andrew, please. Uh, Dr. Andrew, uh, okay. Andrew, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lee Swan, and it is uh, my great pleasure today to join this panel on uh, discussing the future of the sustainable growth. Um, my focus um, 
this morning will be on the circular economy and what that means for ASEAN and how it can contribute for the uh, future of the growth in the, in the post-COVID era. Um, the circular economy is um, a new economic model or, or it could be a business strategy which take into consideration the uh, resource constraints as, as all these economies are facing. And uh, what could be the drivers of the circular economy if you come into this region and uh, we find basically uh, eight megatrends uh, that, that brings the kind of imperative for the circular economy. That could be one is the limitations that we, we have and also uh, the opportunities the future pro put forward. So in the, in the limitations, uh, we have this economic classes are the structural waste that is the, uh, our, our economic structure is producing. And there is also risk uh, basically in access to these uh, raw materials like, like uh, energy and the, and the other, other materials where that is the price is fluctuating. And also the supply chain uh, risk that is attributed to this uh, climate change and the disasters. So this is another set we find that there is advances in the technology and also this urbanization it is happening. It is more than 70% uh, of the GDP will be coming from the mega cities. And also there is, uh, we started accepting these uh, alternate business models. And also yes, as our previous speaker, uh, Hong mentioned, and uh, there is a new regulatory trends in the, in the form of NDCs or the, or the much stringent regulations are coming in the future. So here, uh, the circular economy provides a kind of an opportunity. And uh, another, another major imperative is the kind of resource productivity in this region. If, if you compare that is uh, how much uh, uh, this 10 economies of the ASEAN has producing $1 of uh, uh, output. And here we find uh, uh, it, is, it is incompetitive. And so the competitiveness uh, of using the resources uh, need to be enhanced. And if, if you see, for example, take the case of uh, Germany and Japan, and uh, they, they, they basically they are much more competitive and, and the, uh, when, when compared to uh, our manufacturing industries in this region. On the other hand, and if you look at it, we have been producing more and more waste. And uh, for example, in the, in the case of Bangkok, and it is about uh, one kg per, per solid waste is produced in 2008, which has been nearly 100% in, in 2015. And, um, and out of this uh, waste, only that is the 81% has been uh, not proper, this is, the, um, is, is not properly managed. So, so it, it provides the thing we need to think carefully that is what type of opportunities are available to, to transform this waste and increase the uh, resource productivity. So here the concept of uh, circular economy comes and uh, which focus more on minimizing the use of resources through, through innovation and also reusing the product and services and also sustainability and sustainably designing the products and services, offering the new type of models. And, uh, and in overall, it will result in the system efficiency. So that is our industries uh, can prepare for the future. And, uh, and also as, as a part of this process, uh, it minimizes the system externality. That is the reduce the emissions of the pollutions and will bring this more inclusion. There is a basic concept or the basic principles of the uh, circular economy. But uh, then this uh, COVID and then they came in and uh, the COVID is a kind of a, uh, disruptive and, and we have seen that is the, uh, we have uh, high speed of uh, this uh, digital technology adaptation. And then we find a, a drastic improvement in the, in the healthcare facilities. And also we found uh, the transport and logistics. We have seen the different uh, uh, type of models. Uh, different type of business models that integrate these uh, uh, technologies and as well as the services. But on the other hand, if you look at the, at the, at the left-hand side, uh, we were living in, in, in a very completely different uh, environment before the COVID. And, and uh, as I mentioned, and this resource efficiency is not very high. Second thing is, uh, as, as Hong mentioned, and uh, the threats of climate change is uh, 
increasing and it will be good, uh, coming to worse in the, in the coming decades. And also our cities are becoming more polluted. And so uh, here there is a no uh, way to go back and, and uh, to this old normal. And here we have the opportunities of uh, digital technologies and also different business models. And so here it is no way of going back to this old normal that has been reflected in this uh, ACR of, uh, that has been uh, authorized by, by November 2020 in the last year. Um, and also they think uh, this year and then uh, Brunei has brought up this uh, framework for the circular economy and it has been for the, from the AEC uh, perspective. So if we combine together, and, and this ACR uh, has uh, uh, two components, and one is about the sustainable future, and another is the digital economy. And if we combine together, and here uh, we found uh, more opportunities for the innovation and the inclusion. And uh, here that's the industry 4.0, that is a very, very cornerstone of this uh, circular economy. Many, many countries have been adopting this uh, uh, industry 4.0 strategies and which basically consist of um, absorbing uh, about 10 type of technologies, uh, uh, information technologies and the communication technologies. Then here we have that uh, uh, circular economy concept that has been built up on the five R's. Uh, one is the reduce, then recycling and then reusing of the resources, as well as the two more addition, basically remanufacturing and refurbishing. So this, if we combine together the circular economy concept uh, and the industry 4.0 opportunities, uh, we have more opportunities for the innovation and inclusion. And what, what this combined together, what, what they offer is basically there is a commonalities or the similarities between industry 4.0 and circular economy, because these two concepts are looking for a transformational change. It is not a transition, but a transformational change in way that is we are using the resources and the business models for the adaptation by the industries. Second thing is both are looking for a kind of integrated product and service offering to the consumer. Basically, they give the consumers much more opportunities to select more greener products at a very cost effective way. And the another commonality is it needs more innovations along the supply chain. It is not only part of the supply chain, but the entire value chain for that enhanced resilience. If you look into the supply chain where this enhanced resilience comes, by application of this uh, uh, circular economy principles. And here, this is a kind of a typical value chain that is we find in the, in the, in the industrial and service sector, start from the energy and the material input. And this is the make and then uh, use and then dump. And basically the dumping create a lot of waste and the emission leakages. So what circular economy brings in is a kind of a, new interventions, the circular interventions for reusing it that can go for this uh, enhanced use of the city materials and then remanufacturing and refurbishing, particularly changing these uh, production models and not only the process models, but also production models and also recycling contribute for this uh, enhance the energy and the material input. And here we need a concept of the demetallization. That means uh, our economies continue to grow but in a different way with the less uh, reduced emissions and the pollutions. That need a lot of um, uh, policy interventions and also the policy innovations. This uh, concept of the circular economy is um, uh, not uh, new. Basic, the basic principles of the circular economy are, are a three R principles that is uh, reduced use and uh, uh, recycling. This kind of uh, principles has been already inclined and it has been several initiatives have been done. And for example, uh, the Malaysia, Philippines and Thailand and Vietnam, they have adopted a three R framework and, uh, and they have been systematically integrating this uh, waste management through uh, progressive policies and the plans. And Singapore is uh, one of these countries that has been successfully uh, enabled this uh, uh, three R policies. And now it is expanding. That is how their value chains could be defabricated and remanufacturing dimensions incorporated. And we do have some countries like, like Cambodia and Laos. Uh, they're also becoming a kind of a very aspiring nations uh, looking for uh, 
proactive policies, particularly the Cambodia and the, in the urban sector, they have been formulating these uh, new policies and also the new type of a public private partnership. Uh, so all these things are basically uh, aiming at to uh, reduce this raw material use and uh, promote this uh, recovery plans. But on the other hand, and uh, if you see that is the operational practices that has been evolving in the uh, ASEAN and this uh, this uh, ten economies, and we found a kind of uh, uh, two type of matrix. One is uh, this circular economy principles are being adopted at the micro level, where there is a farm level, and then at the meso level it is it could be at the at the uh, city level or, or at a kind of industrial synthesis that is happening at the at the industrial parts or the industrial towns. And the third one is the macro level. That is the where uh, we have a different type of models and also symbiosis is uh, taking up. And particularly these are dominated by the, at present dominated by the, are uh, driven by these environmental ministries, environmental agendas. But if you are on the, on the left hand side and we do find uh, uh, nearly four areas of uh, intervention. One is that is a production area how we can this primary and the secondary and the tertiary industries can adopt a new type of uh, uh, product uh, production or the, or the process innovation. A second thing is also consumption area, that is where the, the, the consumers and also, and also the governments uh, who are the main, main uh, purchases of these uh, goods and services. And uh, there is a lot of uh, things are happening at the, at the consumption area. And of course, at the city level, and we do find a waste management area where this is a new kind of other policy instruments like EPR, extended producer responsibilities are evolving. Uh, but this is a kind of an evolving practices, which is very dynamic in uh, given that is the wide variety of a different, different type of uh, developmental status and as well as the technological capacity of the countries. But one thing what is missing is the kind of a, um, a cross-sectoral approach to address this problem. And here we need a much more uh, uh, effort in developing this information platforms and then the capacity building. It is, it is happening, but at, not at the level that is we needed. So um, another part of the circular economy is uh, the, our hypothesis, uh, it could be that is combining this industry 4.0 and the circular economy bring the more jobs. And so we did a kind of a simulation analysis uh, for these uh, 10 countries. And, and, uh, and we found basically, uh, it is not in the, in the short term, it is not going to be a win-win situation. There are losers and then some industries will be losing in some sectors will be losing. But overall, if you take that the framework condition of uh, 2020 to 2060, we found uh, overall net job creation and, and in this in this uh, 10 economies. But this impacts so in the, in the job creation varies uh, depending upon the what product you are looking for or what the sector you are looking for. And here we find a strong job creation potentials uh, uh, could be seen in the electronics and the automobile industries, uh, given it is, it is high labor intensity of these activities. And then uh, uh, relatively strong and under relevant job creation is also uh, for we find in the, in the mining and the forestry industries that will improve the uh, resource efficiency gains and also the sustainable infrastructure, particularly there is a construction waste and management where we find more opportunities and more decent jobs are created. And, uh, and in the short term, there will be a kind of uh, job losses may occur and uh, particularly in, in food production and the processing and as well as the textile industry. So these industries need to prepare for absorbing these uh, uh, shocks that is coming with this uh, transition. Uh, and another, another important component of um, uh, circular economy, as I mentioned, is um, it is not uh, simply recycling or the waste reduction. And it is much more like a product innovation and the process innovation. And uh, here, um, ASEAN, and if you look into this input and output, how much uh, resources are going into it and how much is translated into new business models and the improving the efficiency, we can say that is the, uh, the ASEAN countries have been relatively great in, in innovation efficiency. It is not innovation, it is an innovation efficiency that has been converting this um, uh, research and development and the, putting the researchers and then 
intellectual property rights and then patents etc basically uh, we, we are good but at the on the other hand side this uh, circular economy demands much more uh, larger scale innovations in, in the products and as well as the process and uh, here we are lagging behind this oecd in terms of uh, level of innovations uh, and one one cl classical example that is we can see is that is how this vietnam farms uh, who are along a part of this uh, global value chain and how much they are adapting the technologies basically we have a kind of a second mover advantage and and uh, this region is not a kind of a trend setter when coming to this green technologies but but uh, it is a it is a taker of of uh, this this broader uh, stance that that is sandwiched between the global mega trends and as well as the national priorities uh, this is the kind of a uh, status i think where we are and and it is very hard to define what could be the uh, different parameters or the different uh, uh, indicators that is we used to measure this readiness of uh, uh, industry 4.0 or the circular economy and and uh, we did an effort and and uh, see uh, we we categorized uh, about um, uh, six uh, indicators uh, that that uh, uh, sit across uh, uh, different domains like education and uh, capacity building, the financial markets, and also size of these markets for the circular products and services, uh, uh, as well as the uh, technological, that is a capacity and capability to absorb these technologies. Um, and here we found um, uh, very, very interesting results. And, and uh, it is at the scale from uh, one to 10, and we found uh, uh, these countries are moving up, but still we have not reached that is a scale. And and here we found some of these leading countries where are taking that initiatives like like uh, uh, Singapore and Thailand and Malaysia, and they come into a kind of a circular economy leaders and where there is the more favorable environmental existence. And we do have a kind of um, uh, followers and where the countries like. Uh, Indonesia and Vietnam, where they already developed a kind of a roadmap for the circular economy at the national roadmaps. So they are uh, taking the steps. And we do have a kind of a slow movers and, and uh, uh, Cambodia, Laos and uh, um, Myanmar. And these this countries need to be more. And, and basically that is also where uh, the sector specific interventions are needed. And for example, the, the, the circular economy concept in, in the agriculture and the forestry sector is more uh, uh, immediate need in, in, in CLV countries such as Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar. But, but it shows that is the lot of opportunities within the ASEAN to learn from each other and more of about the within the ASEAN we need to develop here uh, platforms and uh, and also learning and the, the best practices and uh, and this this uh, area the circular economy as I mentioned it is it is a kind of a composite uh, uh, strategy to to move into a uh, sustainability paradigm and, and that is very much related to the the ACR of the the broader fifth strategy so how how we can move forward and that need much more innovation and the coordination and the collaboration so um, <clears throat> uh, what, what could be the uh, kind of uh, summary of uh, this this current developments and then the uh, I, I could uh, I could summarize uh, this uh, the whole discussion or the narrative of the circular economy uh, from the perspective of the post-pandemic recovery and and here we can see and we can admit that is uh, there is evolving disruptive models and uh, rethinking of the sustainable growth and uh, uh, as as uh, Dr. Hang mentioned and uh, the green recovery is. Uh, uh, still, it is evolving. The pandemic is not far from over, and the stimulus packages could be enhanced to to uh, to interpret this uh, uh, components of the circular economy and the low carbon growth. Basically, two are the complementarity, and this uh, resource efficiency through the circular economy cons concept is very crucial for the future of the manufacturing industries and also the climate change mitigation. And uh, these are the two complementarities. Second thing is. Um, when we are thinking about this, uh, this effective entry points, and uh, we do have, and, and these three are approaches, but it is not enough. We need much more innovations, um, uh, integration of these five R approaches, and also the new type of financial models are important for the region-wide uh, success of the circular economy transition. And um, 
here the third uh, take home message could be this current approaches to integrate the circular economy concepts uh, to be an inclusive and uh, uh, need a different type of uh, business value creations and we still have the challenges and what are the broader contours of the circular economy and uh, we need to have a key performance indicators and and uh, um, and here also i think uh, uh, we need to set the targets and as uh, uh, Dr. Ha mentioned, and we do have, for example, energy and the energy efficiency, we do have the targets, the collective targets for the region, but we are missing it for the circular economy and the resource efficiency, we need to work on it. And also we need to develop a market scenarios and, and where uh, the circular economy become uh, practiced at, at a scale that is we needed. And here we need to look into that is the uh, waste to energy projects that has been already going on. And also we need to tap this resource of uh, this uh, e-waste schemes and also the plastic waste schemes uh, and how they can uh, share these uh, uh, new products and services. And, and this is a very much uh, important and the upscaling this current models. So the, my, my slide, it is my last slide. And, and uh, when coming to this- um, um, Dr. Anbu, could you just uh, wrap up yeah. quickly, if you don't mind? This is my last slide. I think this is a kind of, uh, we need to see that is a different tools that is uh, to measure this readiness of tool. This is one of the tools uh, that is the area has developed for this region. And it has uh, test the readiness at the, at the two different levels. One is at the farm level, and another is at the, at the policy level, at the, at the country level. And uh, uh, these tools have been developed under the, the consultative process with the different stakeholders. And uh, you can visit our website to, to see this, uh, uh, to download the tool and, and test that is where your company or the country is uh, standing for in terms of the industry 4.0 around the circular economy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Andu. Uh, without further ado, maybe we'll just have uh, Mr. Go uh, give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Ann. Uh, could you put up the slides? So I've been um, tasked to uh, talk about the preparing of workforce for the future in relation to the trends here. Uh, next slide, please. In relation to the trends that we are seeing. Now, you might be wondering why Cisco as a technology company is uh, speaking about the workforce. Cisco does provide technology solutions in different areas like networking, cloud, security, collaboration. And of course, workforce training to us is a key focus because we need skilled people to be able to support these technologies. And you may or may not know, Networking Academy is a program that we have had in place for more than 20 years. And we have trained more than 1 million people in ASEAN uh, under this program. Now we've heard a lot of content this morning. My presentation will be a bit lighter with just a few slides there with questions for folks to think about. So next slide. I'm going to talk about three broad areas, right? Digitalization, cybersecurity, automation, as it relates to workforce. So next slide. The first one on digitalization. So we have all heard this morning how COVID has changed everything, how we used to do things are different. An event like this, I would have usually traveled, but obviously we are not doing that today. Uh, working from home, hybrid work, all this reliance on technologies and our devices, this is all changing. And to, for the workforce, the whole concept of going to the work, going to the office has all changed. So what do we need to rely on these days? So instead of traveling, we are doing things like what we are doing now, video calls. And our digital devices are our windows to all our interactions. So after this current phase, some of us will start returning to the office, but I would expect a lot of it will still be hybrid. And during COVID, we saw that a lot of these hybrid activities, uh, online meetings can be done. But at a skill level, even as an ordinary office worker, there is significant demand on the knowledge of technologies, knowledge of using devices. And living in Singapore, we have seen how the government actually used this time to step up retraining and reskilling of the people. But unfortunately, digital divide will continue to be a very big problem. And it's actually a very difficult one to solve. We have dealt with this for many years. But in the early days of COVID, I had, had uh, spent some time trying to get an elderly friend onto video conferencing. After spending about two hours, uh, the first hour just trying to figure out how to get the data service to work on the phone because you got to make sure she had enough data plan. And then another hour just figure out the app itself and how to turn on the videos and so on. Now, even now, 18 months later, I'm still seeing difficulties with getting her to turn on the video. So clearly there are those who are not familiar with technologies and getting comfortable with using technologies 
it's not the easy thing to achieve. But the bigger issue is actually awareness about dangers and cybersecurity. So maybe next slide. Uh, the, the threat of cybersecurity is ever evolving, and this will be a talk just on its own. Awareness at the individual level obviously is needed. But at the corporate level, we have a statistic showing us that there are about 4 million jobs, cybersecurity jobs, 4 million cybersecurity jobs worldwide that remains unfilled. 4 million. And within Asia Pacific, there are 2 million of these jobs. So if you're in this field of cybersecurity, no worries about finding a job. But the eager, bigger issue is that we need to step up training at different levels, at the user level so the end user is aware. The IT professional obviously needs to know more than ordinary user. The security professional, someone who's in this field. And finally, the persons who are doing security operations. These are all different skill sets that we all need to build up in an environment. ASEAN has done a lot of capacity building in the past years, but it's really not enough. And public private partnership is essential in this. And different organizations have different parts to play in this area. Now, next slide. But let me talk about automation. Now, this is the one that may be a little bit surprised to some of you. Automation AI, obviously, is very much more prevalent today uh, in everything that we do. What used to be very tedious can now be done by a machine. But question is, does that make the human being redundant? Does our jobs get displaced? Now, even prior to the pandemic, Cisco worked with Oxford Economics to study this particular question, and in particular for ASEAN as well. Now, the short answer is yes, our jobs will get displaced. But that doesn't mean there'll be fewer jobs. It means that there'll be different jobs. There was a similar point that Dr. Ambu was talking about when he was referring to circular economy and jobs. So let me give you some numbers to think about. Currently, ASEAN has about 700, no, sorry, ASEAN has about 275 million workers, 275 million. The study that we did at Oxford shows that with automation, if you want to maintain the current level of economic output by 2028, which was 10 years after what we were studying, we will need 28 million fewer workers to generate the same output. So this current level we have now, in, by 2028, we need 28 million few workers. This is because there'll be productivity improvements, there'll be further innovation that makes things a lot more efficient, a lot easier to do with fewer people. Right? The key sectors that will be affected by this will be in agriculture, in wholesale, retail, manufacturing. But the study also shows that new jobs will be created in these same sectors where the jobs are being displaced. But the thing is, the jobs to displace is not necessarily equal the number of the jobs created in the same sector. So for example, in agriculture, we expect, or the, the, the study showed that we expect 9.9 .9 million jobs to be displaced in the agriculture sector. But only 4.2 million will be created in the agriculture sector. So these jobs obviously need to shift. The other dimension to keep in mind is the nature of the jobs have changed. So for example, today you have managers, professionals, and so on. The types of jobs that will be most likely to be displaced will be the elementary workers, the skilled agricultural workers, and the service and sales workers. So we expect that jobs will change. Farmers, for example, will spend far less time in capturing and monitoring information because a lot of this can be done through automation, through IoT, through devices, these things can, this uh, technology today can capture this information for us. We expect farmers in the future to spend a lot more time analyzing data and deriving appropriate actions in terms of what they need to do for their farms and so on, rather than collecting data, which is very time intensive and resource intensive. We expect teachers in schools to also spend a lot more time teaching the young about critical thinking, creative thinking, and less about capturing information. And for the same reasons that automation will take away a lot of those uh, routine, mundane, capturing information type things. But ultimately, what we expect is that a large number of workers in ASEAN will need to be reskilled. They need new capabilities. And for in more likely, they need to move into new uh, sectors. For example, I mentioned just now agriculture. Between 9.9 .9 million jobs being displaced and 4.2 million being created, obviously in between the 5 million or so jobs need to be moved to some other sectors. And we need to retool and reskill these people so that they can move into jobs in the other sectors. 
No, there's a lot more detail that I can go into. In fact, the study has a lot more numbers if you are uh, yeah, into looking at the numbers. But I'm sure if you look online, you look for Oxford Economics, Cisco, and ASEAN, you'll be able to find the report. It is done in 2018, so the numbers are a little bit dated. But I think the point there is still that we need to prepare for this change and this transition that's ahead of us. And for ASEAN, actually, we are very well-placed and very relevant because we have a very young population, which puts us at an advantage. A large number of the population is savvy with technology, and we have an environment that is very much mobile first. But the scaling efforts need to keep up as it takes time to build out the workforce, build out the people with the right skills and technology so that they can take on these two jobs, uh, these new jobs. It'd be too late for us to start playing on the training by the time we see the gaps. So we need to prepare now and prepare ahead. So with that, let me stop my remarks here so that we can get into the, the interactive discussion. Back to you. Thank Great. you.